Hello, ladies. Thank you for joining us. It is TBW Tuesday, and we are right in the middle of spring break, but it is also right in the middle of March. And we are celebrating Women's History Month, Women's Herstory. And so I am, have the honor and privilege of introducing one of our esteemed past state presidents who is here joining us, and um, that is Mary Mackey. Mary Mackey served as our state president from 2016-18, and she is working in the Dallas area as comptroller for the Provi um, Providence Energy. So we welcome you, Miss Mary. I also want to recognize and uh, the other past state presidents on the call, Doris Slay Barber and Pat Bell Burnett and Laura Garza, who has just joined us, the most immediate past state president. So um, welcome, ladies. We have a great mentorship within the TBW, within our, within our state organization. And we also have several members joining us from San Antonio, from San Angelo, from Houston, um, north of San Angelo, um, Great Creek, I think. So welcome, ladies. I'm so glad you are all here. And without further ado, I want to turn it over to Miss Mary. We are going to have some fun celebrating and learning more about women's history. <clears throat> I'll give you the controls, Miss Mary. Give me just a moment. Let me find where I'm at. Okay. Okay. All right. We stand on the shoulders. We walk the path, however you want to look at it, of all the women that have come before us and they've laid down the road that we walk. I have a little, little history for you about suffrage. Um, on July 19th and 20th, 1848, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott spearheaded the first American, American Women's Right Convention in Seneca Falls, New York. Some 240 women and men gathered for a meeting to discuss the social, civil, and religious condition and rights of women. 100 of the delegates, 68 women and 32 men signed a Declaration of Sentiments that was modeled on the Declaration of Independence, declaring that women like men were citizens with an inalienable right to the elective franchise. The Seneca Falls Convention marked the official beginning of the campaign for women's suffrage. Before 1848 and since, women have fought for, campaigned for, and demanded gender, gender parity. Susan B. Anthony, Alice Paul, Lucy Stone, Ida B. Wells, Victoria Woodhull, Sojourner Truth, Betty Friedan, our own Hermine Tobolowsky, Gloria Steinem, Nancy Pelosi, Taylor Swift. Almost 65 years after Seneca Falls, on March 3rd, 1913, the most beautiful suffragist rode a white horse to lead the woman suffrage procession down Pennsylvania Avenue. Who was this woman that represented the new woman of the 20th century, the herald of the future? You're about to find out. She was Inez Milholland. Sit back and, and watch what Inez did for us.
1913, Washington, D.C., the day before President Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. The press and dignitaries are on hand. The streets are jammed with over a half a million gawking onlookers. The march, a massive spectacle of 8,000 women displaying their demand for the right to vote. Their herald, Inez Milholland, a New York lawyer, a young, stunning suffragist. The marchers, women from all walks of life, professions, classes, colleges, and states. Women from countries where they can vote, march. From Finland, Norway, New Zealand, and Australia. 10 bands play. 28 vibrant floats move down Pennsylvania Avenue. The peaceful, dignified, colorful march is suddenly interrupted by surging mobs of men protesting and obstructing the women. Men spat upon the women, slapped them in the face, tripped them, pelted them with cigar stubs, pulled them off floats, tore off their skirts, and cursed them. New York Times. Now there appears a gallant figure out of the pressing throngs, a girl in white upon a white horse, dressed in flowing crusader's cloak, Inez Milholland. She courageously parts the way through the hordes of men and drives an opening for the marchers to continue. Hazel McKay. The dignity of the marching women and the unruly behavior of the spectators creates press attention public interest in the cause. The march also establishes Inez Milholland as the icon for the suffrage movement. Attractive, intelligent, political and independent. This new woman rides astride her white horse into the future. Inez Milholland had been creating herself for years before the 1913 march. Vassar College, she was an outstanding student, actor, and athlete, and involved with the social injustices of her day. She organized suffrage discussions with her classmates and meetings with notable leaders. After being denied entry at Oxford, Cambridge, and Harvard Law Schools because she was a woman, Inez earned her law degree at New York University and opened a law practice to serve women and the poor and to help striking laborers. After she trained with the brave English suffragettes, she returned to America and dedicated herself as an activist for women's rights. Regarded as the high priestess of the women's suffrage cause, Inez led New York marches and was a prominent speaker. She had proposed marriage to Eugène Beausevin while they were both on a transatlantic crossing. She was a free thinker, an international figure, a member of the NAACP, and a pacifist. In the two years after the 1913 Washington March, the Democratic Party in power still refuses to advance the cause of equal suffrage. President Wilson ignores the women. The Woman's Party, under the leadership of Alice Paul, demands meetings and press conferences, delivers petitions, and demonstrates in even more marches. New tactics against the party in power must be taken. In 1916, most women in America cannot vote. 
However, in 11 Western states, women have won their right to vote. The largest number is in California, which is crucial to the national voting outcome. The plan, invade the West and convince the new women voters to use their vote to boycott President Wilson. Inez Milholland is the leader and the main attraction. Her reputation, her dramatic flair and beauty draw audiences and fill halls. Inez travels through nine states in 30 days, giving 50 speeches. Often, the backs of railroad trains and station platforms serve as her podiums, as do cafes, hotel lobbies, and large halls. Her sister, Vida, who travels with her, reports. The trip is fraught with hardships. Speaking day and night, Inez takes the train at two in the morning to arrive at eight, and then a train at midnight to arrive at five. She comes away from the excited audiences, drained and drooping like a flower. Doctors prop her up with transfusions and medication, but Inez will not stop the tour. She will not quit this mission. She is heartened and healed by the power of her message. If democracy means anything, it means the right to a voice in the government. Women are as deeply concerned as men on the matters in our country. It is impossible for any problem that confronts the nation today to be decided adequately or justly, while half the people are excluded from its consideration. To believe that we have no part in determining national events is to believe that women are not human beings. Women of the West, you who possess the vote, use it on behalf of women. Together we shall stand shoulder to shoulder for that great principle, the right of self-government. When we reach Los Angeles on October 24th, Inez is feverish and failing, but robust in her intention to inspire those 1,500 gathered at Blanchard Hall. Elegant even in her illness, Inez speaks ardently with fiery logic. We are not putting our faith in any man or party, but in you, the women voters of the West. Let them know, President Wilson, how long must women wait for liberty? In the middle of this intense sentence, this remarkable woman crumpled up like a wilted white rose and lay stark upon the platform. Los Angeles Times. No transfusions or doctors could save her from the pernicious anemia she had carried for weeks. Inez Milholland dies three weeks later in Los Angeles at the tender age of 30. Newspapers around the country carry the shocking news of the beautiful suffragist's death. Outpourings for this celebrity and heroine fill pages of the press. Three memorials are held as her death is a cry for her work to go on. One memorial takes place in Statuary Hall in the United States Capitol, the first memorial ever held there for a woman. Thousands of her comrades attend. In her eulogy, suffragist Maud Younger emotes, the keynote of her life was hope. Her work for liberty cannot be lost. It lives on in the hearts of the people, in their hopes, their aspirations, their ambitions. It becomes part of the life of the nation. As Inez Milholland has given to the world, she lives on forever. Two weeks later, inspired by Inez's death, the Woman's Party pickets the White House with banners carrying Inez's last words. The picketers are arrested, 
go on hunger strikes and many are forced fed. The courageous and dedicated picketing goes on for 17 months through rain and snow and draws public outrage and political attention to the cause. Finally, on August 26, 1920, the suffrage amendment is passed by both houses and ratified by the states to become the 19th Amendment. Inez Milholland did not live to see the results of her dedication. Her legacy as a noble martyr for equal rights still inspires us today. I am prepared to sacrifice every so-called privilege I possess in order to have a few rights. Remember how precious this right to vote is. One after 72 years of marching, demanding, speaking, and imprisonment. We are privileged voters who stand on their time-worn shoulders. Now it is our voices and our hearts. Voting is the most powerful, nonviolent tool of equality in our democracy. Vote with participation and with pride. That was beautiful. Vote with participation and pride. Last Tuesday was Super Tuesday. I, I know that every one of you voted at some point. I know that I voted early. Um, I had, I've not talked to any TBW members that take that right lightly. But these women did do it for us. Um, I mean, especially her, she wasn't doing it for herself because she knew that she wasn't going to live long enough to, um, enjoy that right. But they, they did it for us. Um, Inez Mil Milholland is not as well known as some of the others, you know, Susan B. Anthony, of course, on the coin and everybody knows her name, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, everybody knows that name, Alice Paul, um, We've watched as a group, and, and I've watched on my own, uh, Iron Jawed Angels several times. Um, I hope that, um, uh, and that's actually, that was on HBO the last time I looked. It is an HBO production, so um, you can either watch it on HBO or YouTube. Um, if you have a couple of hours to sit down and see what they went through, and it is, they did take literary license, of course, but that's that's the way Hollywood is. But it's it's a lot of it is true. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of want to open this up for discussion now, and just um, let you guys tell tell us. And like Laura said, this is a safe space, but. Um, when when did you start voting and, and why did you start voting? Do you remember a time that you didn't vote? Has that always been something that's been important to you in your life? Laura? If yes, I can I can start. Thank you. I was just gonna say um if you are afraid to come off camera, um you can always put it in the chat. But if you would like to come off camera and off mute, we welcome you. This is a safe space. <clears throat> um uh, a, that was a very big privilege for for me and 
being raised by a single mother that she was so strong and taught me um, that having the right to vote is a privilege. And so I, I was always a little self-conscious, I guess, or, you know, um, wanting to learn more about the candidates. And that's what TBW brought into me whenever we started having candidate forums, um, Texas Businesswomen, BPW before that, um, we are nonpartisan. And so we would invite both sides of the party. And that way you are an informed voter. We are not endorsing any one candidate, um, but just bringing information, bringing education um, to the public, to the community. And so that's what San Angelo TVW, BPW did. And um, that was the biggest awakening for me. And very true, not, not to take that right for granted. You're absolutely right, Mary. Anybody else? I see Stella came off mute. Yeah, I was trying to remember when did I start um, voting. And I think, I believe as soon as I turned 21 in California, I think you have to be 21 to vote, uh, which is where I grew up. And um, I always felt like it was a, a, an extreme privilege to to be able to cast a vote and make make a difference, even even if you didn't know if you how many people were voting, whichever way they were voting. But but I was voting and that meant a lot to me. I think our parents, my parents instilled that in us too, as we grew up to, to have a voice and uh, make a statement, regardless of whoever wins, it's, it's your choice to go in there and make a, make a statement on your, for what you believe in. So um, I always saw it as a privilege and um you know, I, I think I grew up in the era where Kennedy was pr elected president um, and so it was, it was a shock when he was killed. And I think that's what brought a lot of my attention to politics or to, you know, who is the president and then what does he do? And now he's been assassinated and it was just so, such an upheaval of, of whatever we were counting on to happen with Kennedy as president uh, that drew my attention more so to becoming more involved in like, who's going to be the next president and what does he stand for? And, you know, things like that. So ever since then, I've, I've been involved with um, just general knowledge. Uh, you know, I'm not a radical politician in any which way, but I just want to keep informed as to what's going on. I read the paper every day, whether that's good or bad. <laughs> I prefer reading the paper to watching the news. Um, at least I can select what I read and uh, stay informed, even if it's just in the background of of being involved in my city and my community and knowing what's going on, um, because we do make a difference and we can change it. And she proved it. She proved it and it took a lot of to her life to prove it. But um, uh, I think that that as women, we we connect emotionally on subjects that are important to us and um, voting is elevates our our strength really it elevates us to a new level of power um over what we want to see happen in the world in our world so um it's it's always been important to me and it, and I've instilled that in in my granddaughter and my daughter so Very um, good. absolutely thank you women do hold up half the world literally <laughs> yes we do I, I I started voting shortly after getting my citizen, U.S. citizenship. Um, since I started kind of young and I had kids that started at 24, I realized I wanted my kids to have more than I had. Um, for me, it was becoming a citizen. I now had the rights and responsibilities to do what I needed to do with my part uh, of being here in the States, right? Knowing that I wasn't going back to where I came from. And now I push my kids to vote, even if they're like, well, nothing's going to change. Well, no, you got to make the change. It's you that's got to make a part of it. So even like my little grandson too, they do little voting when there's elections, they do something, little voting stuff at school. So it's, it, it's being instilled, right? They got to, but they do it with like <laughs> Sesame Street characters so that they <laughs> understand what's going on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for me, it was very important once I became a citizen. I thought, you know what? I have the right to do it. I'm going to do it. So it, it, it's been a while for me. And I continue to push those, some friends of mine that have become citizens, you know, within the past few years, I'm like, girl, now you got the right, go do it. So 
I, I push whoever I can to go get it done. Okay. Very good. Very good. And Doris? I'm going to bring up a topic that most of you are not old enough to remember, and I barely remember, but in Texas for many years, uh, and maybe Miss Ann, you remember this, there was something called a poll tax, P-O-L-L, -L, a voting poll. And in order to vote, you had to um, pay a price. Now, I don't remember exactly how much it was. I think it was probably between 50 cents and 85 cents, but this was in the 50s and 60s. And so um, I was a young child in the 60s. And so I remember going to the polls with my grandfather because he was a poll judge, uh, much like the polling place judges that you have today. But one of the things that I remember my grandfather doing is putting together envelopes for me and the reason I was with him was to distribute to some individuals who would come to vote and he knew that they did not have the money to be able to pay to be able to vote. And so my job was to hand the envelope to the person that he sort of signaled to me as they walked into the door of the of the room that the poll um, and it was a it was a paper ballot back then, but you know remembering that it was a privilege and seeing that in action made a very big impression on me because um, I knew that there were a lot of people and the example of of people like that were were people who worked like on our farm and on the ranch people who helped take care of um, people who were working just down the street at the school, but they were the cook or they were the, um, they were the groundskeeper or maybe even the bus driver. And they were people that knew my grandfather and my grandfather knew them. And if there was someone that he met like on a break or in between elections, that talked to him or he talked, you know, he knew of them. He always encouraged them to come and vote. And if they said, well, you know, Mr. Mike, I can't, I, I just can't afford to. He would always say, always come and I will take care of you. So that's how important mm -hmm. I realize wow. the opportunity to vote is. Um, so when I became eligible to vote, my first boating experience was at a boathouse in the bait house over by the lake. Smelled terrible. What My paper ballot was on top of a, a table that was also sometimes used for cutting fish, but that's okay. <laughs> that was going to be my first opportunity to vote in honor of my grandfather. So, mm -hmm. that's, that's a great story and a great tribute and a legacy from your grandpa, grandfather to provide that opportunity and make sure everyone had money to pay. I hadn't heard of polling tax. Miss Phyllis, I see you come off mute. Would you yes. like to join? Yeah. yeah. And similar to Doris's story, uh, my grandparents would take my sister and I to the, with them to the polls. So we were pretty young. They were able to, we would go in with them and watch them, um, make their selection. And then my sister normally always insisted on pulling the lever, which she could barely do because she was little, but that was our first experience. So when I, I was eligible to vote, that was the first thing I did. And I remember for me, I wasn't always the most, um, the, the front runner candidate. Like I would, I would pick the candidate that had something in common with me. So it's so funny. I, I, um, as I look back through the years, I'm like, Hey, I voted for that guy. And he maybe didn't even make it to, uh, through the super Tuesday, but it was just such an experience to vote for the candidate that I felt, um, most represented me. And, um, you know, of course times have changed and everybody's like vote for the shoe in. So they get the vote. But, um, those early days when you had a, a big, uh, amount of choices. It was really, it was really a good opportunity. Um, and so I, I'm excited that 
that TBW has this and does the candidate forum, because as many of you know, we need that help federally at the local level and and the county level to get things done. And, and we need to let our voice be heard. So, yeah, uh, it's just real important. Very true. Thank you for sharing, Phyllis. Um, something that you just said brought brought another memory to mind that I overheard in in talking to other ladies after after one of our forums. And they said, you know, I still don't know. I guess I'm just going to have to talk to my husband and let him tell me how to vote. And I was like, oh, let's go have a sidebar conversation, sweet girl. Um, uh, <laughs> so that just got me all kind of fired up. <laughs> so just thinking and and thank you Mary for sharing that video um I don't think you know video and music that is just powerful um that is powerful and you just couldn't say it better than watching that video I had chill bumps through the entire thing but just thinking back also um this this started um Inez started in 1913 and Texas businesswomen BPW founded in 1919 just a few years later so here we are, a 105, 106 year old organization um, that we stand on the shoulders of those giants because we, 800 women marched. I don't know, just little things like that just stood out to me. And if y'all do get the opportunity to watch Iron Jawed Angels, um, uh, bring your tissue box because you're just gonna have chills and, and tissues. Um, but the, the trailblazers, the trailblazers that that blaze the trails for us. So we have this privilege um, and the fingertips, the, the technology that we have at our fingertips now um, that wasn't as easy for those ladies who had to hand type on a typewriter, um, who it was it was a suffrage movement for a reason. So just I hope I hope that sunk in. And, and definitely carry on that legacy and pass it on to your nieces, your, your daughters, your granddaughters. Um, that is so important. You know, Stella, um, Armandina, you know, you ladies who are sharing those stories. Sorry, I, I had to, I had to diverge and, and share that testimony too. Any, anybody else have a story to share? Because everybody does have a voice. <laughs> we do have a voice. We do have a story. And, and we stand on the shoulders of giants. Well, I remember that Dave's father introduced Senator Humphrey then, and who became vice president into the Minnesota legislature. He was very, very politically involved. And we have here an invitation to Kennedy's inauguration. John Burmeister Sr. was invited to Kennedy's inauguration. And ever since wow. we got back to Okinawa, I made sure I voted. Or back wow. from Okinawa. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's awesome. It's a fun fact I didn't know about Miss Ann. Miss <laughs> Pat. Oh, yes. Well, first of all, Mary, thank you very much for sharing. I did not know Inez's story. So um, I was excited to see that she was a member of the NAACP. And I think there are lots of untold stories of the suffragette movement that we're not even aware of. Um, I was excited to see on the movie that people from other countries came to vote. I mean, to, to march. And, um, you know, when you're looking at black and white, you don't get the benefit of seeing how diverse that crowd really was. But I think that um, many cultures were represented, African-American and, and Mexican-American. And, and um, you know, I think there were, again, there's lots of untold stories and it's up to us to go and, and find out about those things. Um, you know, for me, I, I don't remember the first time I voted because I was very, very involved in my church and our church was very, um, they were very, I don't know what the word is, but they pretty much prescribed how we should vote. What I do remember is when I started to do my own research and look at candidates according to the topics that I cared about, instead of just doing what my church told me to do, I started to vote based on what I felt was important. And so, um, and I don't even remember how old I was. I think I was in my late twenties. Um, but that's when I started to say, 
no, I don't want to be a one, uh, I don't even remember what you call it anymore, a one issue voter. I want to vote specifically based on who stands for what, what are their voting records, who actually is attending versus, um, you know, who actually shows up to vote that we put into office versus people who are just playing politics. So that started to become more important to me. And um, and I, I definitely have to thank TBW just for all the education. We used to do a lot more education, you know, similar to what Laura said, not endorsing one candidate or another, but really making sure we're informed. Do you understand what these bills stand for? Do you understand the consequences if these things get passed? Do you understand the consequences if they don't get passed? TBW, we really dug deep into things that no one else would ever take the time um, to put in plain English. I mean, it's one thing for attorneys to understand. It's another thing for a lay person to understand it. So um, I'm very thankful to have had TBW um, as a part of my life. And I remember taking Stacy, my daughter, who's 35, to her first rally, seeing um, a candidate in person. And wow, what an experience. Even understanding legislative process through um, Robert's Rules of Order is very, very cool. So lots of great memories through TV Day. Thank you for sharing that. Anyone else want to come off mute? Uh, Laura Garza, you had said, I, I tried. It says, ask to unmute. If Desiree, our resident technician, can help guide. <laughs> uh, if she can't talk, it may be because she doesn't have a speaker connected. OK. A uh, microphone, I mean, I don't know. A microphone, yeah. Because the I only control I have is ask to unmute. And I've that's, clicked that's it. Last, so Yeah, that's mm -hmm. not saw. Yeah, I have to put it in the chat. Okay. Well, yeah, Laura, if you're able to access the chat, you can always type your comments there if you don't have access to a mic. <clears throat> Another we're fun all, fact is, yes, go ahead, Mary. We're, we're all aware that this is a presidential election year, and so that's going to be the focus. You know, there's going to be a lot of national elections and everything, but your local elections, most, you know, I know a lot of people that that don't bother with the local elections those affect you directly. Who your mayor is, who your county commissioners are, who your county judge is, those, the school board members, those people affect your life on a day-to-day -day basis. And we need to be voting in every single election, no matter how small you think it, it, it is. Um, because that, that's your life that, that, they're, that they're making decisions about. <laughs> They make those decisions to control the local governments, and you're living under those local government rules. Very true. Very true. Laura, I saw that you came off mute and then you muted again. Um, whatever you did, you did it, girl. <laughs> <clears throat> But I was also going to say that this day is also monumentous because today, March 12th, is equal pay day where women celebrate that we are moving one day closer to earning the same pay a man is paid. So in thinking of the march that um, 8,000 women marched in 1913, 1915, you know, we, that, that is the platform that we have and that more and more people are talking about it. Um, so it's becoming prevalent. Um, just Two years ago, I think it was, so we're moving up a day each year. So it was March 15th, 14th. Now we're up to, to March 12th and we're at 84 cents to every dollar a, a man is paid. Um, but just like Miss Pat said, you know, as women of color um, had had the different times of being to vote, so do women of color have that unequal, un, unequal equity the difference in equity is greater for women of diversity. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, so it is um, something to celebrate as well today, March 12th. 
That's mm-hmm. one of one of our platforms that we do try to make sure. And one of the first things I remember in TVW, because we had the little buttons, remember, um, where's my 76 cents? Um, and I remember that I'm going to share my age because I was born in 1976. <laughs> So that, um, sorry, that just resonated with me that I remember, you know, 76, um, but we're up to 84 cents. So, you know, that, that matters. Yes, Mary. Uh, I was going to say that that's whenever I, when I joined and that was, it was 76. And that's, uh, I think that uh, my first, whenever I was inducted as treasurer of my local organization uh tina garner did the induction and that's she gave us our 24 cents was that, the way that yeah did, yeah that was the hurt the induction so that was the way i got introduced to all of that the and difference now, that's right where's yeah, my 24 we, cents mm-hmm. we've, we've made uh we've made 12 cents since then <laughs> in okay. in 20 24 in 20 years, years. I, I just in 20 years mm-hmm, uh-huh. mm-hmm. So we're making strides. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Laura, LG and Diana Alcacer. They came on and then disappeared. Mm-hmm. Okay, technology issues. Well, we're at 820. We have 10 more minutes. I want to give you, um, give you, be respectful of our hour. But if anyone else would like to come off mute and, and have a comment, this is just our round table. Time to network, time to visit. Mm-hmm. So I thought I would uh, mention, and and our councilwoman, Phyllis Villagran, who is on this session, Phyllis probably has more accurate numbers than I have. But, you know, the difference um, in the time when I started to vote, we had something in San Antonio called the Good Government League. But in, in today's world, we probably would have called it the Good Old Boys League. And so... Um, we, you know, that is one thing that I think is more women have used their right to vote and voice their opinion. San Antonio is very, very proud to have members like Phyllis. Uh, we have a majority city council. And Phyllis, you may know exactly how many um, large cities have majority city, uh, female city councils. Do you? No, I, I I don't have that number. I know in terms of a large city, we're um, we are one of the largest that has a, a female majority city council. I did meet um, someone from a small town in Colorado, and they had an all woman city council uh, last year. So you know, it's imperative that we we not just vote, but we look at running and winning. Because I can tell you with a majority female uh, city council, it um, it just elevates it because we're getting more done and our male colleagues um, are kind of working more as allies for ca- our cause and then so many other issues. And the other thing I was going to say is, you know, and and you mentioned earlier voting on everything, the primaries, the runoffs, how critical that is, because federally they're watching. The federal government is watching. And right now in Texas, we need them to move a little faster in getting the funds down to the local government. And right now, I know in San Antonio and those of you who are in Dallas and Houston, we're all waiting for um those federal funds to help with the housing, to help with, um, with like we have the national parks here with the missions. We need all those funds to come down. If not, it's going to impact us locally um, and we're just going to have a hard time for it. So that's why it's really important that you get out and vote and you listen to what people are going to say because you want them to find solutions. Not everything has to be partisan. Part of it is just getting the money down so we can do what, you know, we pay our taxes. So we need that money to come back locally so we can, we can do the necessities. So, um, yeah, I just, I, I'm, I'm encouraged by y'all stories and y'all's thoughtfulness. And I'm very thankful for the, the League of Women uh, Voters that put out their, their, their information sheet. Um, and it is about the, 
the politicians that actually show up. Very true. <clears throat> thank you. Um, I, I thought she was on, on the council. So thank you, Councilwoman. <clears throat> thank you, Doris, for recognizing Phyllis. Laura, <clears throat> LG yes. is in the waiting room. I just messaged. No, she joined. Oh, okay. I, uh -huh. okay. There she is. She came okay. off me for a second again, too. <laughs> I think she's having, there she is. All right, now you're on camera. You just have to push the microphone button. <laughs> up, at, up at the top there, of your picture. There, there. You Yay, finally, <laughs> sorry, so many technical issues today. This is what happens when you are you come off vacation and you're trying to do work now. <laughs> no, I just wanted to share my story because y'all gonna, I hope y'all find it fascinating my first time um, that I went to go vote. Um, me, just like Armandina, I'm not a, uh, I became a U.S. citizen. I don't know what, I think it was 2000, the year 2000 that I became a U.S. citizen. No, it was earlier than that. I don't remember when it was. But anyway, my mom and I became U.S. citizens at the same time. So we went through the whole process and everything. So the very first time we went to go vote, I took my parents with me and my mom was like, I don't know who to vote for. And you know how you can't talk on the, and you can't tell them who to vote for. And I kept telling my mom, mom, remember I told you to vote who you need, who you wanted to vote for. But she kept saying, yeah, but your dad said to vote like this. And I said, no, mom, you vote how you want to vote. And so finally she went through the line and she was all nervous. She didn't know what to do. And, and I was trying to tell the, you know, the judges or not the judges, but the people who around the poll that my mom didn't speak English. So somebody can help her in Spanish on how to, to vote uh, or to help her how to do the things because I didn't want her vote not to count if I went and helped her. So anyway, I just wanted to share that story with y'all that um, my very first time voting was with my mom, so. That's great. Thank you for sharing your story. I'm glad you encouraged her to vote the way that she she has a, her own mind. Exactly. To make up her own mind. That's what I told her. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mary, do you have any final comments? Uh, I don't, and I, I thank Phyllis for her, for her passionate um, um, verbiage there, because that was that was kind of mine too. It was just like vote in every election. That's just all there is to it. Um, it does it doesn't matter if it's for dog catcher or whatever. It's going to affect your <laughs> life in some way at some point. Then you need to be a part of the process. And women hold up That's half right. the world. That is that is so true. <clears throat> well, thank you, Mary, for sharing the very moving herstory mo moment with us, um, celebrating March as uh, Women's History Month. But don't let it be forgotten here. Just because it's March, let's keep marching forward every month of the year. Um, if you do follow us on Facebook, I'd encourage you to go out there because we have a post celebrating International Women's Day and uh, share share your story about who was a mentor to you and maybe or who you have mentored, maybe um, who was um, a woman that you want to celebrate in your life. So that just keeps the story going going uh, that we can share because we don't have to march. And we don't have to sit at a typewriter. We have social media that we can get our voice out and our story out to the masses. Uh, so let's utilize the technology that we have and the tools and keep TBW alive. Um, we look a lot different than we did in 1919, um, but that's why we have to continue to pivot, adapt, and change and be trailblazing women. <laughs> so. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us on this TBW Tuesday. I, I did want to mention that Miss, um, our Madam President, Karen Gray, happens to be enjoying spring break herself with her family. She sends her, her message, and I was just um, texting with her, so she sends um, her hellos and everything from Tennessee. 
Um, so Madam President, thank you for keeping us going. We are, uh, and I did want to mention also, make sure you're following us on TVW Connect. We have our registration link live for our state conference and more information to follow. So keep going to our Facebook page, keep going to our, our state website um, because we'll continue to have more details there about our state conference. Um, so share that with your friends, you know, go back to your employer and say, this is an opportunity for personal and professional development. I think that is a work conference. So how about sponsoring me, Miss, Mr. or Mrs. Boss, um, that sponsor me to attend state conference. Uh, we want to see you in in the Dallas Fort Worth area. We are staying um, at uh, Double Tree Hilton in Fort Worth, and we'll, we will be touring the Texas Women's University where a lot of our history is stored. I have a few other members of the state board on the call with me, uh, Desiree Johnston and Armandina Medina. Would y'all like to make any comments or say anything? Just thank y'all for being great members and attending TVW Tuesdays. Yep, I'll ditto that. And looking <laughs> forward to the conference. So it's looking great, people. Great. Um, Deanna, thank you. I see your hand up. Yes, and, and I think today is um, <clears throat> National Pay Equity Day where we finally make as much as a man makes. And I have a T-shirt on. Let's see if y'all can see. Hey, I bought this several years ago. I think the YWCA had a um, promotion and I bought it. So it's a equal pay essay, but that's okay. okay. Equal pay anybody. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Deanna. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you everyone for participating tonight. And I loved your stories. Thank you. Thank you for bringing yes. the film. Thank you, Mary. Very interesting. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Okay. Pat and, and Stacy, you came off mute. Do you want to? Oh, I just wanted to thank Phyllis <laughs> for her service because not many of us have the courage to jump in. So thank you for, you know, what you're doing for us. We appreciate it and hopefully we'll do more to get more of us involved for serving. So thank you for your service. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, uh, would would Doris like to speak to the, um, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name of it for the, with the foundation. Um, Doris Slay Barber is also our BPW, Texas BPW Foundation chair. And we also support the, the candidate. The LBJ. Um, LBJ. LBJ. LBJ um, Women's Campaign School. Yes. Um, so, because of the continued support of LBJ Women's Campaign School, um, the Business and Professional Women's Foundation uh, has been one of the initial supporters of that particular uh, school. And there are only three in the United States. And so uh, the fifth cohort is about to kick off their activities uh, next week. And so uh, we're excited about having that, but the success story in that is the four previous cohorts, which uh, there's one each year, in the fact that we have so many women who have run for office, who have been elected to office, and it's, it's offices of all levels, whether it's school board, all the way up to state senate. And most recently, last year, because of some additional national funding, we have opened up the cohort to uh, a percentage of women beyond the state of Texas. And believe me, we have many more applicants than we have spaces. But with that, I hope that uh, you will look at the uh, website page for LBJ Women's Campaign School. As I said, the fifth cohort is about to um, begin. But Texas Business and Professional Women's Foundation is really highlighted and deep in their heart and ingrained into all of the presentations simply because of our belief in that from the very beginning. And so the goal of the school is to train women not only to 
run for political office, but also to be excellent campaign managers. Because okay, it should have been about how much? Take off nineteen dollars from sixty-three. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure that Phyllis can tell you that. You know, the candidate is is extremely important, but it is the staff and the campaign manager behind them that really guides them to uh, where they need to be, what they need to be, uh, who they're who they're addressing, making sure their calendar is straight. And so, that is a maybe not the as difficult a position. Um, as being the candidate and being elected, but it is a very, very important role. So um, even if you don't want to be in front of the, um, and, and be the candidate, you can always hope to be a campaign uh, manager. So thank you so much, Laura, for bringing that up. Um, it is yes. it's a wonderful opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yes, sorry, I was remiss and I my memory was failing. I didn't remember the name of it. So thank you for speaking to that. Well, ladies, again, we'll, we'll wrap this up and thank you for joining us. Make sure you keep the second Tuesday of every month on your calendar for TBW Tuesday. Um, continue to register. Next month, uh, we'll have another exciting TBW Tuesday. So we hope to see you then. And um, if not, May, and then if not, June for conference. Uh, so, ladies, enjoy your spring break. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Good night, ladies. Good night. 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 Good night.